Luis Michel by Edith Thomas, book review. Okay, so a, a few things to get out of the way quickly. Uh, I make this disclaimer every time, but apologies, I'm going to mispronounce all the French names. I never learned how to speak French, which is embarrassing because I review a number of books about French history. Uh, secondly, this is a biography of Louis Michel by Edith Thomas. So I suppose I should give some brief background on who Louis Michel was, first of all. Uh, Louis Michel was a prominent French anarchist. Uh, and yeah, I, I probably already know this, but just in case I should make this clear, this is anarchist in kind of the 19th century term. Um, meaning an, an anarchist here was kind of the more libertarian wing of the socialist movement in the 19th century. Uh, I know sometimes nowadays when people use the term anarchy, they just mean like, no rules, man, do whatever you want. Um, which is kind of technically what the word means literally, but it's not what the anarchist movement is when you talk about a political movement at a certain kind of time in history. Uh, the 19th century anarchism was just kind of the more libertarian wing of the socialist movement. Um, so in addition to being like a prominent anarchist uh, in France, uh, Louise Michel's main claim to fame is kind of the prominence she assumed in the Paris Commune. Uh, Paris Commune is something I've done a number of videos before about. Uh, Paris Commune was a working class revolution in Paris in 1871. Uh, the exact ideological nature of this is a little bit murky because the, uh, there's a lot of different people involved who had a lot of different ideologies. Uh, it's, but it figures very heavily uh, with kind of Marxist historians. And also there were a number of anarchists involved, like Louis Michel, uh, and it was supported by the anarchists at the time. Uh, so the Paris Commune and Louis Michel have kind of also been a big part of kind of anarchist history and kind of anarchist mythology. So that's the background. That's, that's the figure who this book is about. Now this particular biography was written um, by Edith Thomas, who I don't know a ton about, but if you look at her Wikipedia bio, uh, she was, uh, looks like an interesting person. She was a, uh, a French person active in politics and involved in the Spanish Civil War and the French resistance movement uh, against the Nazis. Uh, I think she joined the Communist Party, but it sounds like she was sympathetic to the anarchists um, during her life. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting biography. It's a, it's a biography of a famous uh, French leftist, written by another famous French leftist. Um, and then originally written in France, but translated into English. So the copy I read was the translated version. I forget who the translator was. And I have some quibbles with the translator, but I'll get to that later. Um, now, Louise Michel, because... Uh, she was a such a polemical figure, uh, a, a leading figure for the Paris Commune, uh, tends to attract the kind of attention that a polemical figure attracts, meaning she's been kind of made into this larger than life uh, revolutionary ideal by the left. Uh, she's been called like the new Joan of Arc or the, the Red Virgin, or the, the Angel of the Paris Commune, and all this kind of stuff. And she's attracted kind of a, a corresponding amount of hatred from the French right, or kind of from the right in general. Um, which makes Edith, Edith Thomas's biography particularly interesting. Because Edith Thomas is largely sympathetic to Louis Michel's politics. And yet, Edith Thomas is not our out to make a saint out of Louise Michel. Edith Thomas goes after her uh, for a number of things from kind of small to big. So it's a largely sympathetic biography, but Edith Thomas is still kind of going after her faults. 
which is kind of the kind of balanced biography that you need for a figure like this or to kind of make it interesting. Um, there are a number of small and silly things that Edith Thomas goes after Louise Michel for, um, which is interesting because, you know, for a figure as polemical as Louise Michel, somebody who's either kind of so loved or so vilified, it's, you know, it's one thing to love her or hate her. It's another thing to kind of make her look silly. Uh, and there are a few things in Edith Thomas's biography that make Louise Michel just look silly. For example, on the trivial side, it turns out that Louise Michel consistently lied about her age throughout her life. She was born in 1930. She consistently claimed to be have been born in 1936 uh, instead. And this was consistently, to, to quote directly from the no sorry, from the biography, quoting directly from Edith Thomas's biography, whether sparring with the judicial system or providing biographical data under calmer circumstances, Louise consistently claimed to have been born in 1836 rather than, as was the case, 1830. This is a traditional practice on the part of beautiful women, but a curious practice, sorry, excuse me, a curious indulgence by a plain woman who, as we shall see, was never preoccupied by affairs of the heart. Yeah, so why did she do it, huh? Why did she consistently insist on shaving six years off her, off her age? Um, another reoccurring theme throughout the biography is Louise Michel's graphomanic manic nature uh, and her compulsion to constantly write poems and novels. I think at one point Edith Thomas even says, you know, for a lot of kind of historical figures, uh, our dilemma is that they left us too little in terms of like a written writing, a written record of writings that are insights into their thought process. She said, Louise Michel left us way too much. She's like, nobody could possibly sort through all the stuff she wrote, all the poems, all the novels. Uh, yeah, so apparently, uh, Louise Michel wrote a number of novels. I, I'm, I think some of them were just for her own enjoyment, not even published. Um, and Edith Thomas says these novels are essentially unreadable. Um, so, yeah, that's... A, a little bit kind of on the silly side, but kind of interesting to see that with this kind of uh, figure who's so loved or so hated, this, this kind of silly stuff about her writing bad novels and writing bad poetry. Turning more to more serious criticism, um, Louise, uh, sorry, Edith Thomas points out that throughout her life, Louise Michelle was kind of a romantic revolutionary. I Means she kind of had romantic dreams of the barricades and the uprisings and stuff like that. But, at least according to Edith Thomas, Louise Michel, it turns out, did not understand political theory. At least that's the allegation made in this biography. Uh, she was a dedicated socialist and anarchist throughout her life. Again, Anarchism in the 19th century being the libertarian wing of the socialist movement. But apparently she didn't really understand socialist economics or anarchist economics, uh, even though she was, she was uh, very fervently dedicating herself to the cause. Um, and like many political celebrities, apparently Louis Michel could be a bit of a sensationalist seeker, uh, and loved the attention from the media a little bit too much. She kind of thrust herself into the spotlight uh, and enjoyed all the attention of being a, a celebrity revolutionary. So that's all kind of to the negative. Uh, some of that's just kind of silly. Uh, some of that's more serious. In spite of all this, though, in spite of all this kind of silliness and ne uh, negative points, you still come away from this biography with an overwhelming adoration or ad admiration for Louise Michel. Uh, 
Louise Michelle always gave everything she had. She worked herself tirelessly for the anarchist cause, even after the onset of old age. Uh, right up until her, uh, until she was close to 80. She was out there organizing, marching, protesting. Um, there was a moment once during a speaking engagement when uh, a deranged rightist tried to assassinate her. And uh, again, she was, um, she was a polemical figure, so she attracted this kind of hate. Uh, and he, he shot a gun at her, and I think, I forget exactly, I think like maybe the bullet might have even lodged itself in her head or something like that. Or maybe I'm getting mixed up with another case, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but Louise Michel, far from like demanding vengeance, forgave her assassin and then intervened in the courts to save him. Um, which struck me as very charitable. Uh, now, I mentioned there's another case that I sometimes confuse with this. There was another anarchist whose name I'm probably going to mispronounce. It's an American, but with a French name, Voltrain de Clare, something like that, who actually is from my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan, so I, I should know this better. She was also, similar circumstances, giving a, a speech, a tempted assassin, uh, and she also forgave him and then, then tried to intervene in the courts to save him from prosecution. And uh, if I can just interject a little bit of my own opinion, uh, I find this tradition within the anarchist cause of kind of forgiving your opponents and trying to kind of not only forgiving them but trying to kind of not demanding vengeance against your opponents but trying to, to, to intervene to save them I find that tradition very attractive. Uh, I know that on the left, that's not always been the case. There are elements in, there, there are points in history when the left has been brutal or vindictive. But to the extent that there's this kind of forgiveness uh, trend, or what's the word, heritage, uh, and kind of leftist history, that's, that's uh, one I would like to identify myself with. I, I think about this, sorry, I'm editorializing more, but I think about this every now and again when there's an incident like, uh, and this comes up every now and again, when there's kind of some right-winger who's had some sort of fall from grace and it turns out uh, they messed up their taxes or they had done this or they had done that and they get locked away in jail. It doesn't happen often, but every once in a while a prominent right-winger will have a fall from grace and people on Twitter on the left are just going after him, like, yeah, lock him up, throw away the key. And I think, ah, this is ungenerous. Like, it, it's one thing to be going after them when they're in a position of strength. But once we've won, you know, once they've had their fall from grace, then I would like to see on the left a little bit more forgiveness uh, in the tradition of Louis Michel or Voltrain de Clare whose name I'm not getting right, but, but this kind of anarchist leftist tradition of saying, no, we, uh, we're not going to prosecute our opponents. Uh, we're going to forgive our opponents. Sorry, that was a digression. Uh, back to the review. Um, Louise Michel, until her death, all the European governments were so frightened of this little old lady, and she became a little old lady near the end of her life, that she had an escort of police spies following her everywhere, kind of even into her 70s. Uh, the only exception was England. Uh, England in the 19th century was much more chill about radicals uh, than kind of what was happening on the continent. Uh, so, you know, there were a lot of uh, European radicals who were living in exile in England, and England just kind of left them alone. Uh, and in fact, um, yeah, in the biography, Louise Michel says she much prefers uh, England because the government at that time had a more relaxed attitude towards political refugees and radicals. Now, I, I mentioned at the start that Louise Michel is most infamous for her role in the Paris Commune. And I have to confess that that's the reason I pick up, picked up this book. I confess, I suspect that that's true for most people. But interestingly enough, 
she had a long life after the Paris Commune. Uh, and the whole I ordeal of the Paris Commune, from the beginning to end, actually only occupies a small portion of this biography. So if you're only interested in the Paris Commune, kind of be forewarned ahead of time. Um, over half of the book takes place with Louise Michel's life after she returned from exile. So, so she had been sent off to exile as punishment for her participation in the Paris Commune. But after they brought back the exiles, uh, after they brought back the exiles, you still have over half the book to go. And that is how, uh, talking about Louise Michel's li life as a leader in the anarchist scene in kind of the 1880s and 1890s. Um, yeah, and as Edith Thomas notes in the introduction, one of the things that makes Louise Michel such a fascinating figure is that old age never seemed to slow her down none. Uh, she continued leading demonstrations and speaking in political clubs right up to her death at near the age of 80. Um, so, it's a little disappointing if you're hoping for a detailed look at her role in the Paris Commune, but it does provide a fascinating look at the anarchist movement in France specifically and in Europe in general in the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, the spotlight is always on Louise Michel, but kind of through her life you can see broader political developments, uh, such as the first May Day demonstrations kind of organized in France. Uh, Louise Michel was featured prominently in them. Uh, then, of course, there's the times during the 1890s when uh, the anarchist movement became associated with terrorism, you know, kind of the bomb-throwing anarchist period. Uh, and then there's also during the 1890s there is the Dreyfus Affair. I'm not going to get into that, that's a separate video for a different post. Uh, but the Dreyfus Affair um, split the anarchist community. Interestingly enough, the anarchists did not rally fully on the Dreyfus' side, apparently. Uh, some of them attacked Dreyfus and some of them were supporters of Dreyfus. Um, And then there's the Russian Revolution, not the one of 1917, Louis Michel didn't live to see that one, but the failed one in 1905. Uh, and, you know, people kind of forget about that one because it's a failed one. But uh, through this biography, uh, Edith Tom, Tom, Thomas, the author, talks about all the excitement that was built around this Russian 1905 revolution among European radicals at the time even though it ultimately ended in disappointment. Um, Louise Michel had a number of very high profile friends. So even though she was a kind of an anarchist, she had friends with, who were in the mainstream. Um, probably the most notable is writer and politician Victor Hugo. Um, Louise Michel loved Victor Hugo, and Louise Michel was a huge fan of Les Miserables. So if, if you like me, I'm also, I also really like Les Miserables. If you like Victor Hugo, uh, if you like Les Miserables, and you're wondering, is there a connection to radical history? I mean, here's one for you. I mean, the whole book Les Miserables is kind of revolutionary anyways, or has some revolutionary themes. Um, but yeah, Louise Michel apparently uh, wanted to be called after the revolutionary leader in Les Miserables, whose name I'm also going to mispronounce here. What, what was it? In, in Rolis, in Rolis, uh the, the leader of the barricades. So she had a correspondence going back and forth with Victor Hugo in which she called herself after that character. And possibly Victor Hugo and she were romantically attached or maybe Victor Hugo slept with her. Apparently Victor Hugo was like quite the, um, what's the word for this? He slept around a lot. He, he had sexual liaisons with a lot of people. Louise Michel may have been one of them. Uh, Edith Thomas actually kind of explores this. I, I will sometimes see it asserted just as a fact that they slept together. Um, 
Apparently it's not an uncontroversial fact. There's some evidence to suggest it, but we don't know for certain. And Edith Thomas kind of gets into this, kind of all the evidence to indicate that maybe there was a, a sexual liaison between Victor Hugo and Louis Michel. Um, there's also an apologies, I'm going to mispronounce another French name, Georges Clemenceau, uh, who later became Prime Minister of France during World War I. He is another fascinating figure, and I'm going to have to save that for another video. But, you know, he, he kind of started out kind of young and radical. Uh, he was uh, a radical mayor around the time of the Paris Commune. He wasn't involved in the Paris Commune except like for a brief incident when he tried to like broker a, a, a ceasefire between the, the two groups. Um, but he was, and then he, he kind of uh, did not support the Paris Commune after that. But he was uh, always kind of on friendly terms and uh, often financially supported Louis Michel. Um, and then either it became more conservative during the end of his life or events changed depending on how you look at it because he kind of was famous as Prime Minister of France during World War I for kind of crushing the socialist opposition to World War I and be kind of a, a real warmonger. That's a separate story for, for another time, so moving on. I love this biography. I've got two quibbles, and they're not quibbles with the author, they're quibbles with the translator and with the publisher. Uh, one, there was no index. So it, there were all these characters kind of wandering in and out of Louis Michel's life, uh, and some of them I knew who they were, and some of them I got confused at points, and I would have loved an index to better keep track of the characters. Secondly, the translator. So, for whatever reason, the translator did not translate any of the poems into English. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but there are so many poems quoted in this book. Louise Michel wrote poems throughout her life. A number of them are quoted in the book. There are also poems written about her. Uh, one by Victor Hugo, which apparently was about Louise, or one by Paul Verlaine. Um, so when you add it all up, there is a lot of kind of untranslated chunks of French poetry which fills up the pages of this book. And I don't know why they didn't translate that into English, because if I could, if I could have read the French, I wouldn't have needed to get the translated version of this book. I would have just gotten the original French, right? So if I get the translated version, then you know I can't speak French. So then why do you leave all this untranslated poetry? It, it, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm complaining about a small thing, but it, it, if, if you get your hands on this book and you flip through it, there's just so much poetry, uh, none of which is translated. It's just quoted in French. And then, this is a small thing, but it irked me. Uh, the translator has her own introduction, and she apologizes for translating the street names into English. Uh, she translates all the French street names into English. Um, and she says, yeah, I know I probably shouldn't translate the street names into English, but she says, I have based my own translation choice on one simple assumption. Most people who read a translation do so because they do not speak the language of the original publication. Very sound logic. But then why did you leave all the poems untranslated if that's your logic for translating the street names? I don't know. In spite of that, I would recommend this. Uh, if, if you, uh, it's one of those kind of, uh, I don't think it's currently in your bookstore, but you can track down a used copy on Amazon or interlibrary loan or something like that. If you're interested in the Paris Commune or the history of anarchism or just kind of radical history in general, fascinating read.